Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David, and I'm the pastor here. And uh, last week, we started a new study in the book of Romans. And we wanted to do that because we're heading into fall, right? And that's a good time to start a new series. Romans is also a very clear, systematic, structured book that spells out exactly what it is that Christians believe. So last week, we looked at verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So here, Paul starts talking about grace and faith. And he says, you know what? This is all that is required for salvation. It's not earned, it's not paid for, it's it's free. Okay, it is free and by our faith we are saved. Okay, nice part is over. (laughs) In the very next verse, Paul's going to take just a sharp turn and jump right into what it is that we need to be saved from, namely sin. We need to talk about sin today, which means uncomfortableness, maybe some squirming in the seat, because when we talk about sin and I hear a sermon about sin, that means that I'm bad, right? Sin means God is angry and I could, I could suffer his wrath. Sin means punishment. It's the threat from our mother, right? Just wait till your father gets home. A man went to church and afterwards he was asked by his friend, hey, what did your pastor speak on today? And the guy said, well, he preached on sin. And his friend said, well, what did your pastor have to say about sin? And the guy said, he's against it. Yeah. Can we just go back to the happy parts of the Bible? <laughs> Unfortunately not. We, we cannot simply preach the parts of the Bible that make us happy or the parts that we already agree with. Believe me, there's verses and words in today's passage I would love to skip. It might be uncomfortable to listen to, just know that it's also uncomfortable to preach. So because it's uncomfortable and a lot to get into, I think we'll just go slow. We'll just take it a verse at a time, okay? Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness, suppress the truth. There it is, the wrath of God. Wrath is certainly one of those Old Testament words, those, uh, you know, specifically Bible-sounding words. I don't think I ever used the word wrath in my day-to-day life. Wrath is the Greek word orge, and it means anger, temper. It means indignation. This isn't a characteristic of God that we like. It's not a characteristic of God the world likes. Some might even argue, well, how does an all-loving, all-knowing God even become angry? Well, what does Paul say God is angry about? He says ungodliness and unrighteousness. So I guess that means whenever I'm bad, right? God is angry when I act ungodly. God is angry when I am unrighteous. No. If that were the case, then God would be angry all the time, right? He'd be angry all the time at everyone. God would spend his entire existence just being angry. Tell me something. If God is angry when we are ungodly or when we are unrighteous, when is that? Just when I'm sinning? Just when I'm doing something bad? And, and what, is, what is the sinning? What am I doing that's making him angry. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. When I was a kid, my parents were happy when I had good behavior. They were angry when I had bad behavior. So I'm sure God must be the same way. Old Testament, the book of Psalms. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. The Psalm writer says, I was born this way. Not only was I born this way, I was born into sin. I was born into sin behavior. Sin is a state of being. Old Testament again, Isaiah. 
But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. The reality is, because of sin, there is now a chasm between how God wants things to be and how things are. So, ungodly and unrighteousness, those things, they put us far away from God. Everything on, on this side is separation. It's ungodly, it's unrighteousness, but it's not a behavior. Sin is not a behavior. Sin is the conditioning of how we are born and it's where we exist. We live here. So godlessness is anything that does not reflect God's image or his purpose. Sin causes bad behavior, not the other way around. I am not a sinner because I behave poorly. I behave poorly because I am a sinner. Sin is the root of the issue because there is power and depth to sin. Sin is more than just acts of disobedience. The act of sin arises out of a heart that is already corrupt, already sinful. My heart is already polluted. It's already contaminated. And sin arises up out of a corrupt heart. This is why the psalmist agrees. He says, I was born into sin. Sin is more than something you do or or not do. Sin is a power that starts in your heart. God tells Cain, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Sin seeks to rule over you like a master. And there is a subtlety to sin. There is power and depth to sin, but there is also a subtlety to sin. Sin is subtle. What does that mean? It means sin comes up sneaking up on you from behind to hook its claws in you before you ever even realize that it has you. Some of you, probably fishermen, probably duck hunters, bird hunters, right? You know all about lures and decoys. The lure is meant to be subtle. It takes the fish off guard. A decoy tells a bird flying overhead, hey, it's safe to land down here. And before the animal knows what's going on, they're hooked. They're dead. It's too late. Sin isn't something that you can play with. You can't have just a a quick look or a small kiss. Sin is like pouring lighter fluid on charcoal. One match with no effort and you have a fire. When Adam sinned all those years ago, it was though he had opened a box that he should never have opened. When he disobeyed, sin entered his body, it entered the world, it affected everything. Everybody, billions and billions of people have been affected by that one moment of weakness in the Garden of Eden. It was spiritual anthrax. Sin enters the world and it's lethal because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And it's all because of that one moment. Our world has become one big spiritual ground zero in the eyes of God. That that is the world that the psalmist says you are born into. And from that moment on, people are born with the problem of sin. It's not as simple as correcting behavior or trying to do better. You know, last week we talked about preaching the gospel. And we said that Jesus saves. That's the good news. But you can't start from there. You can't start with Jesus saves. You need to start with, I need saving, right? You need saving. We need saving. Jesus isn't good news unless we all know what it is that we are being saved from. How, how is he the Messiah? What does he save us from? Sin. And the fact that we are all sinners, even Christians. It's true. It's true. <laughs> we, we can do a test to see if it's true, okay? Just ask yourself, did I make a mistake last week? Was I selfish? Even for a moment, was I egotistical? Did I make it all about me? Do I have unkind thoughts? Do I have impure thoughts? If you were honest and you answered yes to any of those questions, then you are infected with sin. And Romans 18 says that because of our ungodliness, because of our unrighteousness, God's wrath is revealed. And verse 18 ends with, and 
unrighteousness suppresses the truth. What truth? Well, he tells us in the very next verse. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. What is the truth? The truth is God is plain to them, meaning his existence. His existence is obvious, right? Paul says, just look around. Can't you see God everywhere? The entire natural world bears witness to God through its beauty, its complexity, its design, its usefulness. No one can complain that there is lack of evidence of God or his character. The, the fault is not on religion or it, it is not up to us to prove, okay? There is evidence and yet people complain of lack of evidence. They suppress the truth. Dr. John Lennox of Oxford, one of the most famous, most renowned mathematicians in the world, and he wrote a book about how ludicrous it is for people to believe in evolution. Dr. Lennox calculated the probability of life spontaneously developing out of random chance to be less than one chance out of a trillion, 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 trillion. You know, it's, you have better odds of winning the Mega Millions Lottery because that's only one in 302 million. Romans says, God has given us creation as evidence of his existence. That's why Paul says humanity is without excuse. That's the natural revelation that all creation declares the glory of God. I hear it all the time about how evolution is science, proven, and that if you believe in God or believe in the Bible, well, then you're stupid or that you're uneducated. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. I believe that God is visible in everything. Everything that he has created, his creation displays his existence, his nature, his character, the wind, right? The wind represents the Holy Spirit that moves around us. The sun represents the sun, right? The light of the world. Rainbows remind us of God's promises, God's miracles. The rain symbolizes blessing, that God causes growth. Cells, molecules, atoms, all remind us that God cares about the details of our lives. But in spite of the remarkable, detailed, organized world that we live on, many still doubt, many still refuse to believe, and they will even argue that God does not exist. And Paul says that suppresses the truth. Why? Why would humanity want to deny the existence of God? Well, then they're not responsible. They're not, not responsible to anyone but themselves, right? There's no moral order, there's no morality, then I can do whatever I want. What else does Paul say? He says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relationships with women who are consumed with passion for one another men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Verse 23 gives us the biggest behavior problem of sin, idolatry. Probably weren't thinking that, were you? Claiming to be wise, it says, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. 
Most of us probably don't think about idolatry too much because we associate the word with idols or a, a carved image. But we can't dismiss idolatry so casually. After all, the Ten Commandments lists idolatry as number one, right? You shall have no other gods before me. So our first sin behavior issue is our rejection of God. Sin leads to a rejection of God. You have been created to love and worship God. That's why you exist. Job one, before anything else, before work or play or leisure or home or sports or children or money, loving and worshiping God is how we stay godly and righteous. Once we divert from that, then we step away from how we were created. And believe it or not, we are created to worship. And so this is where we run into trouble. When we try to worship something other than God, you put something other than God in that place. True, it can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. But the substitutions for God are not God. And they are going to fail us because a substitute cannot do God's job. A substitute cannot bear the weight and the responsibility of your life. And you build your life on something else, that foundation is going to crumble, and then you will experience suffering. Because all along, you are worshiping the wrong thing. What is the second behavior issue? Dishonoring our bodies. A simple definition of sin would be choosing a path contrary to God's instructions, contrary to God's design. God instructs us in ways that are for our best interest. So sin brings a bad consequence. And sexual sin is especially harmful to us. In short, choosing sinful behavior damages us. So it's our choice. Every day, we must choose to believe that God's way is better than our way. And that includes choosing to follow what God says about our bodies and sexual conduct. It's actually very simple. At Walden Church, we use four words to shape who we are supposed to be, who we were designed to be. Love God, love others. When we don't love God, you get idolatry. And idolatry is exchanging the natural way we were created for something lesser and inferior. When we don't love others, we bring dishonor. And dishonoring our body is exchanging the natural way that we were created for something lesser and inferior. Well, pff, what does it matter? I mean, come on, no harm, no foul. Two consenting adults, my body, my choice. I'm not hurting anybody. Okay, then why does the Bible use words like lust, impurity, dishonoring, lie, dishonorable, contrary to nature, shameless acts, penalty, and error to describe dishonoring your body? Let me give you an example. Let's say I'm helping my dad fix the car, okay? And my dad says, go get a tool, okay? And I come back with a hammer and a saw. He's going to be mad at me. <laughs> Why? Well, those are the wrong tools. Th those are carpentry tools. Those are not auto mechanic tools. Well, what's wrong with doing it my way? It's my car. Why can't I be allowed to use the tools that I want? Because it will not get the results that you want. Your car was designed to be fixed and repaired with specific tools. Hammers and saws were designed to work with very specific materials. I suppose it's your car, and I suppose you could use whatever tools you want, but a hammer and saw will make things worse. And before our pointer finger comes out, on any one passage, or on any one phrase, and say, see, see, let's stop 
and remind ourselves, Jesus saves us all. Saves us all from sin. A little further into Romans, Paul writes, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. We have been created for a relationship with God. To live with him as he being the center of our lives. All have turned from God. We've all tried to run our own lives. We all say we are in charge. It's the main reason. It's the number one reason for the brokenness in our world. The idolatry, the selfishness. The good news is God loves us. And he's been looking for us, seeking after us, pursuing us for longer than we realize. That's the good news. But the bad news is that we continually choose something else. And we put that something else in God's place. And because of that choice, Romans says, they did not see fit to acknowledge God. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, maliceness. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, mal- maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So the unrighteous did not see fit to acknowledge God, and what happened? The Bible says God gave them up. Your Bible may say God gave them over, but he says it three times. He says God gave them over to lust of their hearts, to impurity. He says that in verse 24. He says God gave them over to degrading passions. That's in verse 26. God gave them over to a depraved mind. That's verse 28. That might seem very confusing, but it's actually very simple. The unrighteous and the ungodly, they pull away from God. And God, who does not want to hold them hostage, lets them go. See, that's the sad fact. The sad fact is sometimes God gives you exactly what you want. You want God to let you go? You want to pull away from God? Psalm 81 says, My people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. It's not a New Testament thing. It's not new, is it? Humanity has always wanted to choose their own way. In Romans, God shows how the unrighteous and ungodly make a choice to reject God. And that choice sets them on a downward spiral of increasing darkness and decreasing hope. Look at how this passage ends. Those bad words, right? That long list of bad words. It just gets worse and worse. And this is where we are today. Look around. Church attendance has been down 10% since COVID all over America. Do you honestly think that attendance in the church is down all over America because people don't like the music? Or, you know, you should put a fresh coat of paint on the outside of your church. Or, or, you know, pews, you should replace those with chairs. Or, you know, your pastor's always wearing a suit and tie. He really should wear jeans. Anything. Do you, do you think it's something as simple as that, that if the church would just make a couple of tweaks, then all the people would come running back? No. Not according to Romans. Romans says, when all the people pull away, God lets them go. That means when we squander the incredible gifts that God has given us, God removes his influence and his presence from us. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, he had to deal with an entire nation who rejected God. They rejected everything. They refused to repent. They refused to obey. They were idolaters. Jeremiah 11 says, therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will bring on them a disaster they cannot escape. 
Although they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Verse 14 says, do not pray for this people, nor offer any plea or petition for them, because I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their distress. At the end of the day, it's all about my fulfillment, human fulfillment, idolatry, sex. God says, your fulfillment has to be in me. Verse 28 calls that acknowledging God. Verse 28 says, when you acknowledge God, that is when you say, my fulfillment is in you. The irony here is when we pull away from the creator so that we can discover who we are, be our true selves, we, at the same time, are losing what it means to be human. We are created beings. So it's only God that makes us whole. It's only God who can define us. And it is through our relationship with him that we find our true identity and receive what we need the most. And that's all the good words. We need all the good words, forgiveness, reconciliation, identity, purpose, love. The good news of the gospel is that our sin, our sin and God's wrath does not have the last word. The very things that we long for have already been made possible to us by Jesus. That's the good news. Romans 5, 8 says God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came to save his people from sin. That means sin is a big deal. It's a really big deal. Sin separates us from God. Sin eats our souls. Sin lures us with fulfillment, but it delivers emptiness. Sin is a decoy that promises us greater freedom, but in truth, it kills us. So what do we do? I think we need to start learning to talk about sin the right way. Maybe like me, you felt spiritually manipulated when you were young by the subject of sin in the past, you know, scared into repentance. I have all kinds of personal scars and it's very hard for me to not be critical about myself. I am very hard on myself and I'm a Christian. So you can imagine how hate and shame hurt the unrighteous. Images of Christians that are holding up hateful, condemning signs. You see them everywhere you look. I tell you, this breaks God's heart. God hates gays. Abortion is murder. It's actions like that that keep us from loving our neighbor, loving our enemy, those are the things that we were commanded to do. It's actions like that that keep people away from the church. So we need to redeem the subject of sin. I think the answer is we need to talk about sin more, not less. We need to stop hiding from it, stop tiptoeing around it. We need to bring it out into the light. We need more open discussion about sin but in an atmosphere of love. And it starts with you and I being honest about our own struggles and our own failures, not pointing the accusing finger outward, but inward, because the gospel is, I once was lost, right? I, I once was lost and now I'm found. I once was blind and now I see. We start there. We show the unrighteous something that they have never probably seen before in a Christian. <laughs> Humility. Because I think we also need more empathy in the gospel. We need to destroy the measuring stick. Please, please, we need to destroy the measuring stick. There is no sin that is greater than any other. There is no one person who is more righteous. Many people are staying away because they feel, I don't measure up. And they're worried, well, if I come, they're gonna judge me. The gospel is supposed to be good news. 
we need more gratitude in our gospel. I bet every person who was ever healed by Jesus, who was ever touched by Jesus, was thankful. I bet the woman cleansed of blood when she was healed was thankful because she had been an outcast for 12 years. I bet Jairus, when his daughter came back to life, he was thankful because Jesus gave him something more than just his daughter back. He gave him back hope. Do you think that when Jesus did miracles, that was just a display of kindness? Jesus was just being nice, you know? He didn't do those things to be nice. Jesus was displaying a world without sin. Death and disease are the results of sin. And through Jesus, him being near, him being present, those things are removed. By acknowledging God and living in the world his way, sin is destroyed. And for some of us, that can be a very simple prayer. For some of us, we would just pray, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That might be it. That might be all it takes. Just an admission. Just a prayer of repentance. Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Just get back on the right path. And for others of us, maybe you feel even further away than that. You've been carving out your own path for a really long time and you're kind of at a place now where you're recognizing that the road ahead doesn't lead anywhere good. You tried it the world's way. And now it's time to admit. Admitting selfishness, admitting seeking your own way, admitting that you're a sinner, there's no shame in that. You are not perfect. God does not expect you to be perfect. I am not perfect. If heaven was a reward for perfect people, it'd be empty. Romans 3 says all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. A church is not a place of perfect people either. We are just a group of people who have decided to be a family to one another. And a family is made up of imperfect people, but people who are loving to each other and who believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus, that he was a man, that he came to this world, that he walked amongst us, that he said the things he said, and that he showed the world what hope looked like, what grace looked like, what love looked like. And then Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And if you believe that, that Jesus can offer you a new life, that he is key. The book of Acts says there is salvation by no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among people by which we can be saved. If you can admit that you're a sinner, and if you can believe that Jesus is King, that he is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, then the Bible says the only thing you have to do is just confess it. Just say it out loud. Romans 10, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And a new life and a new beginning is that easy. Replacing whatever that idol is and putting God in his proper place is just that easy saying that you are going to live a life of godliness and righteousness is just that easy. Right where you are. Right now. You can just repeat these words and pray this prayer with me. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin, from myself, 
and from all the habits and hurts and hang-ups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to repent and live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life and save me with grace. I want to learn to love you, trust you, and become everything you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, plug into a church, a physical church, not an online church, not MP3s, not podcasts. Attend a place of worship. You don't need to look far. Go where the people in your community go. Find the people that live around you, your neighbors, your friends, your family. Wherever they go to church, go there. And if they don't have all the programs that you need, help them create the programs that you need. Plug in and be a part. Give as much as you take from the church. Use your gifts. Be a help and receive the blessings of Christ's bride on earth. At Walden Church, we have two services. We have one at 9.30 on Sundays. Uh, we have a choir. We're going to sing out of the hymnal. We're going to do responsive reading, say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to have communion. It's going to feel just like the church that you grew up in. At 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. You can come dressed casual. Be relaxed, enjoy yourself. Uh, it's also the time where we have our full children's program from birth all the way through high school. We say, we wanna be the church where you live. Be the church, as in the verb, right? Our job is to be the church where you live. We hope to see you Sunday. Bye.